Not so fast. Champion runner Casta Semenya is ordered to take drugs to lower her testosterone if she wants to keep competing. Is the decision fair? Or is it needed to ensure a level playing field in elite sport? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Imran Khan. Kasta Semenya is an inspiration to many women around the world. But the South African Olympic and world champion athlete is accused of having an unfair advantage because her body produces more male sex hormones than most females. To stay in the race, she's going to have to change her life. She's lost a legal challenge against the governing body of world athletics, which issued a new rule forcing her to take drugs to lower her testosterone levels. Supporters say that ensures fair competition. Critics argue that Semenya is unfairly targeted because the rule only applies to middle distance athletes like her. The Court of Arbitration for Sport admits the regulation is discriminatory, but say it's necessary. The president of the International Association of Athletics Federations praised the decision. Sebastian Coe is here in Doha for Friday's Diamond League event where Semenya is due to compete. I think this is pretty straightforward, and it's very straightforward for any international federation in sport. Athletics has two classifications. It has age, uh, it has gender. We are fiercely protective about both, and I'm really grateful uh, that the Court of Arbitration has upheld that principle. Semenya's lawyers and the South African athletics governing body are considering an appeal. And we ourselves extremely disappointed in the outcome because it's not correct to have a law which plays out in a way that nobody knows yet until it does play out. And you can't have the person who makes the law also be the person implementing the law and deciding how it plays out. So that is not the way we see fairness. So what exactly is her condition? It's called hyperandrogenism, which causes her body to produce more of the male sex hormone testosterone than most women. Between 5 and 10% of females are thought to be affected. The UN says that up to 1.7% of babies worldwide are intersex, meaning they don't fit typical definitions of male and female. Testosterone boosts the amount of red blood cells, increases muscle mass and strength. Doctors are divided on how much it improves an athlete's performance. Let's bring in our panel. Joining us from London, Sylvia Camporesi, Senior Lecturer in Bioethics and Society at King's College London. From High Wycombe on Skype, John Brewer, Professor of Applied Sports Science at Buckinghamshire New University. And also on Skype from Oxford, Julian Savalescu, Director of the Oxford Uhiro Centre for Practical Ethics at the University of Oxford. Welcome all to the programme. I would like to start with you, Dr. Sylvia. Semenya was born a woman. Uh, it's not her fault that she has uh, this imbalance of testosterone. Surely should she, she should be allowed to compete. It's not an unfair advantage, is it? <laughs> you really touched an important point because the discussion hinges on whether her advantage is unfair or not. And we just heard uh, Sebastian Coe say that uh, the case is uh, straightforward, pretty straightforward, and... Uh, actually is anything by straightforward because it's quite complex. We need to m distinguish whether the advantage derived from testosterone level is unfair or not. And this is not what the Court for Arbitration for Sport has done. The Court for Arbitration for Sport has requested the IWF to investigate, to do research on levels of testosterone and performance advantage. And they come up with some results, which, by the way, have been demonstrated by several teams, including uh, my team, uh, to not be replicable. And this has been highlighted in the verdict of the Court for Arbitration for Sport, where they note of the difficulty on relying on a concrete advantage, but they do rely on a theoretical advantage uh, between levels of testosterone and performance. However, the point I've been making as a scholar working in ethics and sport, and as a former runner, middle distance, also not a professional one, is that this advantage is not unfair. 
Let me bring in De uh, John Brewer here, uh, uh, just right now from High Wycombe. Uh, it's not unfair, says uh, Dr. Silvia Camparesso. She should be allowed to compete. I think Sylvia's hit on exactly the, the whole problem with this case, and there's never likely to be any winners. So I, I did a fair bit of commentary on it when the case first went to the Court of Arbitration for Sport, and it was clear right from the outset that this was a very difficult situation. Uh, indeed, only yesterday, when you listened to the verdict that the, the CAS made, it was a majority verdict, it wasn't a unanimous one. And clearly, whilst they have come down and said that the testosterone levels need to be reduced. And, and let's remind ourselves it's not just within Castor Semenya, it's within, within all athletes, all female athletes, that they have recommended, or the recommendation the IFWF have made is, is that their testosterone levels should be reduced. So we're not just picking on one individual, although I can see why, in a sense, it seems that way. Um, it, it is still a very grey area as to the extent to which the levels of testosterone will influence performance. I think we have to bear in mind that, uh, as Sylvia said, Testosterone is a growth hormone. It causes, as you said at the outset, uh, higher levels of performance in terms of increased muscle mass, and muscle mass will lead to extra strength and power. Um, what we don't really know, because it is quite arbitrary, is the exact cutoff point at where that performance gain starts and where it stops. And I think particularly with female athletes, where we know that there are variations in hormonal levels on a monthly basis, and in, indeed, when females are pregnant, for example, it is something that, again, as the Court of Arbitration for Sport said, is going to be very, very difficult to monitor and to police. Uh, and I would just pick up on one point that you made about Gaston Semenya not being allowed to compete. Of course, she will be allowed to compete, but only if she and other athletes with similar conditions can demonstrate that their testosterone, is, uh, testosterone level is lower. Um, I was speaking on South African TV last night uh, as I, I was asked what the next step for her should be, I genuinely think that um, she now is such a great athlete that she has the ability and hopefully the desire to carry on with her training, carry on doing what she has done so well for so many years, and actually in some ways prove the doubters wrong by showing that she can still win on the World and Olympic stage, still win uh, gold medals and break world records even with uh, a potentially lower level of testosterone. Of course, she may also decide in parallel with that to, to submit an appeal. Um, but I believe she is a great runner, a great athlete, and that actually will, in a sense, be borne out even with a slightly lower level of testosterone. But what we're asking her to do and other athletes in her position to do is to take performance-reducing drugs. Now, performance-enhancing drugs are banned from the sport completely. So... This seems to be an ethical question. Let's bring in uh, Julian Savalescu in Oxford here. Um, what are the, what's the morality of all of this? We're actually, in effect, asking somebody at the top of their game to not be at the top of their game. Is that what we're doing? Well, uh, as uh, we exactly are, what, what Sylvia correctly pointed out is, is whether this level of testosterone represents an unfair advantage. And if it does, what you should do about it. Um, so, in, with respect to the first question, uh, I completely agree with her that the science hasn't un established the degree to which her elevated testosterone level provides her with an unfair advantage. You've got to remember that, that she probably has a condition which means the receptors for testosterone don't work properly. We don't know what a normal level of testosterone would be for her. We don't know how her body functions or indeed her brain functions under this level of testosterone. So even if you reduce her performance by reducing her testosterone, it could be due to effects on her brain. It could be due to the side effects of the drugs. It could be due to a whole bunch of different factors. And unless you can give a really accurate story about what, what biological features we're entitled to and what we're not and how testosterone works in a complex situation like this, you shouldn't be ruining somebody's career or life. Which brings me to the second point, that um, even if you thought there might be some significant advantage, um, this woman has been brought up under a current set of rules. She's trained, she's been treated as a woman, she's been allowed to compete, and to change those rules midway through her career denies her the right to work and the right to live, effectively. Uh, a much better solution would have been to introduce rules that affected athletes in the future, for example, when they're about to start their career, not midway through their career, a so-called grand grandmother clause. Um, but the problem altogether is this so-called level hormonal playing field, which 
um, the CAS and the IAAF want to establish um, isn't really a level playing field because you don't know the response of the receptors to testosterone. You don't know the complex biology of the individual athletes. And that story simply hasn't been worked out. So, so I think it's Dr. very Sylvia, let me bring you. Let me bring you in here, Dr. Sylvia. The science seems to be problematic. So why not, as uh, Julian Savalescu said, allow her to compete whilst you figure out the science? Yes, definitely that could have been an option. Indeed, I mean, I must say when uh, so I was expecting like uh, everybody else, uh, the verdict yesterday, um, I was disappointed but not surprised. And I think uh, it's important, so this is such a complex and not straightforward issue, that to understand yesterday's verdict, one needs to uh, go back a few years and understand Duty Chand case. So Duty Chand was an Indian sprinter also targeted by the former hyperandrogenism regulation, which were put in place in 2011 in response to Castor Semenya's case. So you have a case that goes back 10 years. So you had Castor Semenya at the Berlin World Championship in 2009, but she was not able to appeal to the hyperandrogenism regulations that required her to lower the testosterone level. Then, thanks to Duty Chand, who appealed to the court for arbitration of sports, the regulation were suspended in 2015 on grounds that there was not enough evidence about the correlation. However, as I had noted in 2015, the grounds on which the regulation were suspended were the wrong grounds. And let me explain why. Court for arbitration for sport uh, in 2015 wrote very clearly that uh, uh, they believe the IWA have uh, had reasons to have this regulation, that this regulation were necessary. This language echoes yesterday's language about necessary discrimination. But in 2015, Cass ruled that there was not enough evidence about the proportionality of the regulation. Now, the IWF was given two years to do this additional research, which they have submitted. It was mostly the new regulation which targeted a restricted set of events from the 400 meter to the mall were based on a study published in the British Journal of Sport Medicine in 2017, which identified this uh, middle distance event as the events in which women with high level of testosterone had the higher performance advantage. However, this study had not, results had not been replicated and actually as I was saying, with Simon Franklin at the London School of Economics and Jonathan Ospina Betancourt at the University of Brighton and uh, Spain at Burgos University, we've been able to show that the result cannot be replicated. So why these five events? I think it's fair to say that Castel Semenya has been targeted. Now, I would be curious to see if Castel Semenya starts competing in a different event with the IWF regulation change. The IWF has called the regulation a living document Cass, yesterday in the verdict, they had advised to defer the application of the regulation on grounds that is of the difficulty on relying on concrete evidence of an advantage. However, IWF is quite ironic, but said they have not really taken up the advice to defer the application of the regulation. They give an athlete one week, one week to lower their testosterone level in order to compete on May 8th. So you're saying it's, it's very unfair. Let me bring in John Brewer here. This is sport, sport is supposed to be fair. Um, these IAAF regulations, these rulings, are designed for a level playing field, um, and it's designed on age and on sex. Is it time to take a real hard look at that and to try and come up with a different definition? Or is it simply, we've got to draw the line in the sand somewhere? Yeah, I, I think we have to almost think more broadly than that and look at the whole integrity of sport and what do people want from the sport that they watch, and indeed, the sport many millions of pounds is invested in through broadcasting rights, through sponsorship deals and so on. Um, and, and I think I am bitterly sad and, and sorry for athletes such as Casta Semenya, who are looking, as we've, we've already said, at their careers and wondering whether they can carry on competing. At the same time, and I, I, the things that I don't agree with, with Lord Cohen, but on this occasion I can see where, where Seb is coming from, in the sense that we do have to create an environment that enables female athletes who don't have abnormally high levels of testosterone to feel that they can excel, compete and do extremely well in female sport. And we only have to look over the last 20 or 30 years at the way in which very rightly um, female sport has grown and developed and had much greater levels of participation, much greater levels of sponsorship, 
much greater levels of coverage. And, and that is absolutely to be welcomed. I think we also need to bear in mind that the issue with, with Castor Semenya, and again, we, we come back to this inevitably, it seems as if it's sort of he's targeting her as an individual. It is, as, as I said earlier, something that affects all athletes with hyperandrogenism. But it, it's also to some extent being clouded with another very difficult issue, and that is the one of transgender athletes, and in particular males who go through sexual reorientation, sexual transition to become uh, females and compete as females. And part of the reason why the IAAF and other people are looking at testosterone levels is a way to, again, level that playing field to ensure that when an athlete does go through a sexual uh, re reallocation transition, that they have a testosterone level that at least puts them in a category or at a level where they can compete alongside of the female athletes. It's an extremely difficult area. Um, and as I said earlier, one that, that probably will be no winners within. But uh, I do believe that we have to protect the integrity of sport. At the same time, as Sylvia has rightly said, there is still a lot of research that we need to do to work out exactly what a cutoff level is. But bear in mind that testosterone, uh, in, in a different way when it's measured, is banned by the World Anti-Doping Agency because of its performance enhancing effects. So that we know that forms of variance of the testosterone itself will enhance performance. What we're not quite clear on is exactly what those levels are. So this is, in a sense, a fairly crude, crude tool. It's certainly one that there needs to be more work and research uh, done to, to really get just right. And inevitably, in this situation, it's not going to be a win-win for everybody. There are going to be some winners and some losers. And I think what we have to do is to have these sorts of discussions uh, in a very level-headed and pragmatic way to come up with the best solution for both individuals and for sport as a whole, and indeed for society as well. Uh, Julian Savalescu, John Brewer brings up a very interesting point there. I just want to uh, ask you a very direct question. Um, are we now in a position where we're trying to, uh, to regulate the human body, where we're trying to legislate the human body and what it's capable of doing? And surely that's bad for the sport. This is naturally occurring in Casta Semenya. Perhaps it's naturally occurring in other people. It just means that they can compete at that level. Yeah, I think that's exactly the point. The, it's inconsistent with the logic uh, of sport as it currently stands, that you're meant to be testing an individual's natural potential, but you're trying to reduce their natural potential with testosterone-lowering drugs. You have to remember that the definition of a woman used to be, until the 90s, um, having two X chromosomes. Uh, if, if that had continued to be the definition, Castor Semenya wouldn't have been allowed to compete because... She probably has a condition where she has a Y chromosome uh, and androgen insensitivity. Um, now, she didn't make the decision to change that definition. It was made by the sporting authorities. And so they moved to an anatomical definition of what it is to be a woman, which she conforms to. Anatomically, she's a woman. She has a female appearance, uh, even though she may have internal testes um, and those are producing testosterone. So they chose to move to a different definition of woman, and within that definition, um, she is completely natural. That's not her decision. She's conformed to the rules. I completely agree we have to have a set of rules, but there'll always be grey cases, and you shouldn't be disadvantaging people who have conformed to the rules, um, and you decide to change them midway through. Um, it's important to recognise that this decision doesn't apply to all intersex conditions. It applies to only those people with XY chromosomes who also have high levels of testosterone. But there are other women and other conditions in intersex that produce high levels of testosterone that aren't, aren't covered by this judgment. So she is being discriminated against very clearly, even amongst intersex athletes. I was reading a very interesting article. Uh, Dr Sylvia, I just want to bring you in here. A very interesting article that suggested uh, that the people running sport are overwhelmingly male, overwhelmingly white, and overwhelmingly over the age of 60. So their definition of what is a man, what is a woman, uh, is very set in stone and perhaps a little old-fashioned. Do you think that has anything to do with it? That This has definitely something to do with it. In fact, already in 2012, uh, with my co-authors at uh, Stanford University, we wrote an article for the American Journal of Bioethics where we were targeting the hyperandrogenism regulation and we pointed out how there were different levels of unfairness uh, in the regulation, including the way 
that were being drafted and implemented uh, and, and looking at the kind of people that were making this decision. I think it's really important to distinguish uh, the point um, of whether is this advantage unfair or not. And back to 2015, in order to understand today's case, CAS could have ruled in a different way. Indeed, I'm really curious to read the 160 pages of the uh, entire um, verdict when they are published, because it says that uh, it was ruled by majority. So I understand this as there was a minority that didn't agree with the, rule, with the ruling. Uh, what this means is that CAS did not engage with the question on is an advantage given by testosterone unfair? Now, let me give you an example about other natural advantages. There are uh, natural conditions, mutations in a hemoglobin receptor gene. Uh, if you have one of these mutations, you produce a higher level of uh, red blood cells. The red blood cells carry oxygen in our body. If you have about 50% more red blood cells in your body than another athlete, it's like being naturally do doped you have natural doping. And we have cases of athletes who had this mutation and had an advantage in competition. The Finnish skier Manti Ranta is a famous example. In the 61 gold medals um, and Innsbruck Winter Olympics with uh, an advantage of 40 or mm, 45 seconds um, on the silver medalist, which is a huge advantage. But that was not considered unfair. It was clearly an advantage. And as it may be the case that testosterone uh, is an advantage. However, I think the science uh, underline uh, the advantage conferred by testosterone is less robust. So let me bring in, let me bring in been, John Brewer here. John, I just to want to ask consistent. you this, the same question that I asked Dr. Sylvia. Um, is sports management, sports ruling elite, overwhelmingly old, <coughs> overwhelmingly old fashioned and simply out of touch with everything that's going on in the modern world? It's a good question, and I can see why you would, you would make that, because if you look at the, the, the composition of many national federations, national governing bodies of sport, then sadly, I, th I think you're very right, that there is a, an over-preponderance of, of, of males, middle-aged males, people like myself, dare I say. Um, whether they're out of touch or not, though, I, I would tend to, to argue against, and I think one of, the, um, one of the potential implications of this ruling is, is that we will see those in other federations start to look at what's happened within athletics and wonder whether the same ruling would be applied to their particular sport and their particular federation. So I think over time, uh, we may actually see that this starts to extend. And there will, will be those, particularly in team sports, uh, where you'll have 12, 15 individuals all competing in a team you know, against another team. There is more likelihood, perhaps, that, that we will see those, those, those national federations deciding that they would try to apply similar regulations. So whether that means that they're out of touch or not, uh, I don't know. I can't really be absolutely certain on that. But at the same time, um, I look at the way in which sport has evolved over the years. And again, if you look at the Olympic Games, which has involved uh, many more new sports, younger sports, if you like, if you look at the growth of the Winter Olympics and indeed the Paralympics, what I think we are seeing globally is in a sense a revolution in sports that are seen now to be mainstream. And along with that, I do think that we are getting much uh, younger, much more vibrant people at the head of those sports and hopefully a greater awareness of what's happening in, in the real world. But uh, I wouldn't... We are running out of time and I, I would like to ask uh, the final question to uh, Julian Savalescu just very quickly. Uh, this is the same question. Um, are the sports governing bodies out of touch? Is the science developing far too quickly? Um, is this a problem uh, for athletes like Casta Semenya? It's simply that the world is changing and the sports governing bodies aren't keeping up. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think the science is rapidly emerging. It's very complex. It's probabilistic. Uh, and they're not aware of how to deal with the ethical issues. And they don't have an ethical framework um, that's satisfactory for the complexity of the issues. But I think there are two other issues here. I think they're worried about opening the floodgates to transgender athletes. I think that's exactly right. And they're also worrying about encouraging doping using testosterone in, in uh, normal athletes, uh, that this will be an encouragement um, to use doping in order to compete with, with um, intersex athletes. And both of those are legitimate concerns, but they're separate issues. And I don't think uh, Caster Semenya should Sadly, be escaped. Sadly, we are out of time. Uh, thank you very much to all of my guests.
Silvia Camparesi, John Brewer and Julian Savalescu. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the whole team here, bye for now.